Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Dating After Divorce podcast. We have the best conversation for you guys today. Like, it's going to be so, so awesome. I'm here on Zoom with my friend, colleague, and special guest, Dr. Stephanie Byerly. And uh, Stephanie is a trauma informed professional coach. She is an upset. I knew I was going to stumble over this word, but let's just go obstetrical anesthesiologist. Anesthesiologist, I know that one. (laughs) And certified life professional coach, as well as a leadership consultant. Um, Stephanie is a fierce advocate for wellness for all physicians. She has a special emphasis on women physicians. And um, she has an article titled Female Physician Wellness Are expectations of ourselves extreme. And, you know, I hope we can link that up. We should link that article up in the show notes as well. I just wanted to, just wanted to say that. All right. Welcome, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's, it's just amazing to be here. Yeah. All right. So we're talking dating after divorce amongst other things. (laughs) Um, would you, I don't know, you can, we can just dive right into your story. Uh, you have been, uh, married, and divorced twice, and you are currently, you've been partnered for a few years now. Four years, yes. Four years, and yeah. you have quite the story, and I think um, your journey really mirrors a lot of my clients and a lot of women who listen to this podcast, so where would you like to start? Um, I, I would love to start talking about being, I guess, when I was married for 10 years, you know, got married looking into my, you know, in my professional life. So I was still in medical school, um, had a lot more years of training to go, you know, but, but really was like, okay, I'm supposed to get married. You know, mm-hmm. I met somebody. Um, and then you know, it was, okay, so now we're supposed to have kids and, you know, all this, and it was difficult. And I'm sure a lot of your, your listeners, your clients go through the same thing about when you're a female professional, woman professional, when do you have kids? There's no great time, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we had two daughters and things just got really, really bad. Uh, We ended up moving, um, you know, started our, basically our life out of training for being physicians. He's a physician as well. And, uh, you know, it was very ugly and um, was one of these where we both had joint custody, but it turned out, you know, one of my daughters has some significant issues and it was very much a fight the whole time, basically until she turned 18, they were three and four when I got divorced. So that was a huge, huge struggle. And then even the financial piece Mm -hmm. Um, and as being a, you know, a professional woman who's successful, when you go through a divorce, you don't expect your husband at the time, you know, going through the divorce to ask you for child support Mm -hmm. and things like this. And so it it was, um, it was difficult. It was, it was, it was very ugly. And my, Mm -hmm. what I came out of from that was that you, this is, this may sound awful, but you don't know who you're married to until you get divorced. Oh yeah. No, hundred percent. And I won't hijack your story with why I believe that, (laughs) but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, in fact, now I tell my clients as they are, cause we have these stages, we slow down the dating process and we have these stages and milestones and, um, so that they can consider everything. And I said, I always tell them, consider what a divorce from this person would look like yes. <laughs> because whatever you imagine it would look like is the indicator of whether this person is right for you or not. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. And yeah, it hasn't failed yet. <laughs> You know, with my clients who are partnered in the sense that when they have paused to consider the person's temperament, temper, um, how that person speaks about their ex-wife, if they have one, Mm -hmm. some of them have been like, oh, no, we're good. And then a few have been like, I need to maybe watch just a little longer to make sure. Yeah. And, and you know, um, I would say, and what happened was I then for two years and my ex-husband got married pretty quickly to a woman who had kids and um I then was like you know what I'm gonna put myself out there on the dating scene and I met someone who you know we thought 
uh, thought it was, you know, it was okay. I think part of my mindset too, though, was like, I needed to find, have a family for my kids, just like Mm -hmm. they would go to their dads. And um, this person and I actually went to counseling together. And it was the conversation of is the fact that I make more money than you, as, you know, as a physician going to bother you? And it was, of course not, of course not. No, no, no. Um, you know, you know, when you first meet someone, right. And you're so impressed by them and you love everything about them. But then when you start to have issues, then yeah. you are driven crazy by everything, you know, and then it yeah. became, you're so controlling and you're so this and you're so that, and that we ended up, one of the reasons we ended up um, getting divorced after 11 months was that this was such an issue between us. And, and so that was like, wow, you know, how do you meet somebody as a professional woman? And I was a single parent, you know, as well, um, that how are you ever really going to feel secure or trust? Mm -hmm. So, um, it was a long time, you know, before I met somebody, uh, but, the whole dating thing, I did meet, meet someone and we were together for six years. We were engaged and I ended up breaking that off. Um, but then I was like, you know what? I'm done. Like I'm ready to just be single and live my life. And I was really for the first time recovering from a lot of traumas in my life and really understanding about how that trauma had affected me. And again, one of my daughters has had some significant issues and I was like, mm-hmm. okay, so I going through the process of healing from the trauma, one of the biggest things I had to work on was that I was actually going to trust myself to make decisions and hold boundaries in Mm. relationships and especially, you know, intimate relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and when you say hold boundaries, I mean, no, knowing the boundary you want to set in the first place requires you knowing yourself, like knowing what you verbalizing, what you really, really want. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm, my partner that we've been together for four years, I think one of the reasons that it's really worked is that he's very independent. So we mm-hmm. both came to the relationship, each having our lives, separate lives, mm-hmm. and we didn't need each other for anything, you know, financially, mm-hmm. anything. We just wanted to be together, but literally on our first date, we went on a walk and it was July in Dallas, Texas. It was a hundred of five degrees and we were sitting there sitting you know on the bench and uh I was like you know what I'm just gonna might as well put this out here right now I'm a professional woman I'm fierce I'm Mm. independent um I have my boundaries I make a good living no man is ever gonna tell me what I can Mm -hmm. and can't do and especially what I can and can't do with my money and you know I you know, I'm just putting that out there. And if that isn't okay with you, then, you know, no need for a date too. And mm-hmm. uh, you could tell he looked at me and he was like, that's fantastic. You do whatever you want and make this much money. It's <laughs> um, so, um, you know, that was, I, I laid it out there, but I will say that, you know, and we're in different places in our lives. You know, our kids are on, are in their twenties, both, both of us. And, and 30s and so we don't have young kids so we're not like Mm -hmm. raising children together which I you know certainly adds another piece to it but we come together again with separate lives but we come together because we want to be together we've had our issues that we've had to work through Mm -hmm. and um, certainly boundaries major boundaries that it was like look you know if we can't get through this doesn't make us bad people it just means we didn't work out but this is something that I'm not willing to compromise. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Oh my gosh. I have so many questions. <laughs> um, so just going back to, you know, the reasons, cause you had said, you know, the second marriage, you wanted a family for your kids. And this actually comes up with a lot of my clients where when we're doing their initial self-discovery and I'm like, we're really diving deep. Some of these things come to the surface But it's like, it's an acceptable goal. Some of them are like, well, I want to date, uh, when we're doing the ideal partner profile, well, I want to date someone who has kids so that, you know, my kid will have someone to play with or my kid will have a sibling. And, you know, I have, there are ways that I coach them through that. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? And why do women, why do we have these like, 
I don't know, things that we think we're supposed to have or we're supposed to provide for our kids or things we're supposed to do. You're supposed to get married. You're supposed to have kids. When you get remarried, you're supposed to make sure that, you know, you, it's almost like we attach something to that family picture. And so we're always trying to put it back together. Yeah. And, you know, especially after going through the, our advanced feminist coaching certification that we did and just learning about uh, about all the things that women are socialized to believe in that, mm-hmm. you know, we're supposed to be married and we're supposed to be in a relationship and we're supposed to have children because if we don't, then we're not really fulfilling our purpose for being on this planet. Mm-hmm. And that goes back to, you know, to the caveman days. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, we have to remember that as women, if we weren't liked by men, we were kicked out of the cave and got eaten by a yeah. tiger, right? Yeah. And so to realize that, that this just has continued through the ages and how you're raised in your family and what their stories are around marriage. I mean, I think this generation of, of parents may be a little different, but a couple of generations ago, it was all about as a woman, you had to get married and yeah. you had to have kids, right? And if you think back to, you know, 2000 years ago, right? Women were, you had to get a dowry and it was all, marriage was not a love thing. It was a financial agreement between two families, right? And yes. women got sold into marriage and things like this. So, and then if we think about our epigenetics and if you're a woman of color, et cetera, and all mm-hmm. the marginalization pieces and you know, certainly um, I have some Asian clients and they're like, oh my God, like all my parents ask me every time we get on the phone is when are you going to get married? Did you meet somebody, yeah. you know? And so I think it just drilled into us. And then what do we, what do we see while we're in school? What do we see in social media? What do we see on the movies? Right. Yeah. And social media, I think has made it difficult, right? Cause we see these perfect pictures of these mm-hmm. Instagram families and blah, blah, blah. And you know that most of the time they're fighting in their home and they're miserable. So it's sort of like, we think we're going to feel a certain way if we get something versus Mm -hmm. what's the real reasoning behind it. But a lot of it is as women, we just are told we have to have a man to give us our opinion of ourselves, like that we're, yeah. we can't validate ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, and we need to take care of children and a husband to, to actually mean that we have meaning. Yeah. And, and that's one of my, my biggest things with my coaching and my trauma coaching and my leadership coaching is for men and women to understand how they're socialized, to believe what they believe about each other, women in leadership, yeah. and try to work through it from a non-judgmental, no blame, but let's understand why you think I'm bad at this, mm-hmm. and why I think I'm bad at this, and then all the external barriers that we face. Yeah. But when people under, start to understand like what goes around in your brain, if 95% of your your, you know, 50,000 thoughts a day are subconscious and it's all this negative hamster wheel, reel of negativity. I'm not mm-hmm. good enough. I need to be with a man. I need to get validated by a man. You know, it's like, we're not our thoughts and we shouldn't blame ourselves from that, but we're really realizing why we do the things we do. Yeah. You know, how we think we expect we're going to feel. Then we get there and we're like, oh, this is it. Okay. <laughs> what's next? Cause I yeah. don't feel, I don't feel much better. Right. And, and it is sold to us as like, this is the goal. When, mm-hmm. I mean, as a kid, I mean, we're trying on wedding dresses as little girls mm-hmm. and we're pretending to be walking down the aisle because we've been sold that that is the thing. That is the goal. That's the Holy Grail. And if we don't question it, then it's sort of like uh, my, well, my very first um, coach, he called them um, uh, injunctions. He's like subconscious injunctions. It's like, they're like commands that are programmed into you. Just, you know, not necessarily on purpose, but like just, you know, socialization and you have to obey. So now it's inside of you. And we learned this in our feminist certification. It becomes what um, I think Carl Lowenthal called internal bias. So now you're internally biased. So now you have this automatic re- reaction to the world without thinking about it. And I think that's what happens when my clients are like, oh, I need to marry someone who has a kid, my kid's age. Because instead of thinking, Am I choosing a partner because I want to be partnered? (laughs) Yeah. And what kind of partner would be most suitable for me? (laughs) Who am I? What do I want out of life? And who would I most enjoy, you know, being with in life? It's all of these other external requirements so that my mom will be happy and my kid will be happy. And we don't even know that that's the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because when I, I think when you fall in love and, and everything is just so wonderful. 
when you don't really get down to the nitty gritty of like, do we parent the same? Do we agree mm-hmm. about these major things about our children? I mean, these are the things that really, really get in the way, especially if you're blending families. And oh, that yes. was an issue in my second, you know, second marriage. And uh, it really did absolutely cause major issues. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you are blending families, then there are things you need to think about. But if we're being pushed because, well, you have to have a family, you should blend a family, then we're not even thinking about what that really looks like. And what was interesting for my client who had the question, I need a man who has a kid this age. I said, you know, blending families isn't easy. So like, why would you like choose that on purpose? (laughs) It is not easy. Right. And then, you know, um, and and then it's again, like you said, it's all the shoulds and all the should mm. not haves and all. Oh my goodness! I heard a great term the other day. <laughs> um, you know how we say we must do something like shoulding, mm-hmm. masturbating. Mm-hmm. I thought that was <laughs> hilarious. Must- I heard that on the call. I yes, it. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's a new one. But yeah. you know, that's the things we tell each other. I must do this. I must do this because we're going to again feel a certain way as we learn. You know, with our life coaching. We think yeah. we're going to feel a certain way. And then if the thoughts behind it aren't there, then we're, again, we're like, what's next? Yes, 100%. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask about kind of like your healing journey, because you said you went on this healing journey in order to be able to finally set boundaries that gave you peace and helped you thrive in your relationships. Like, what did that look like? Were there certain modalities that you use or were there like certain thinking patterns that you worked on? I, um, so what ha- I had been on a, um, a healing journey for a while. Uh, finally I had, well, let me back up. I had, um, my mom was married five times and she had pretty severe mental illness. And, um, I had, there was some sexual abuse there and, and abuse and things like this. And so these things sort of led me on a track when I was sort of growing up and I had a lot of healing to do about a lot of that kind of trauma. And then some traumas in my, my first marriage. And I was like, you know, I got to figure this out because I can't keep blaming my mother. I can't keep saying it's her fault. It's her vibe. Like I got to take responsibility and figure this out. So, um, I really started going to to meditation. Um, I started doing my trauma therapy, regular therapy, but this was like a journey. I think, and I think the thing that was the most poignant was, um, about five years ago when I did my trauma, my trauma know, coaching, because I really had no idea at all that as a 52 year old woman, I was making decisions about something that happened to me when I was three. Mm. And so that really helped me understand a lot about why I was the way that I was and that it couldn't have been any other way with how my nervous system was pretty much set up from the time I was almost born. Mm. And so, um, just, just all the things that had happened. And I was like, you know what, I I want to figure this out. I needed to be there for my daughter who was going through a lot and my, you know, myself. And so it was the starting to meditate, uh, really doing a lot of mindset work, mind, body healing. Um, and then I learned about coaching and I was like, oh my goodness. So when I went to coaching school, I never had any idea how it was going to transform my life. And so then what I did was I wanted to, to get my trauma coaching certification to really understand how my traumas had affected me, how mm-hmm. they affected my children, and how I could also help my clients, but also help in my workplace too. Because when you understand about how trauma affects people in the way of being like, what happened to you, mm-hmm. instead of what's wrong with you, you walk around the world very differently and even in the workplace differently. And especially like in healthcare with everything that has happened. So I continued, you know, my healing during that way. I'm probably a little woo woo um, with some of the things I do. I got my sage that I burn and I, I've got, you know, my incantations. I'm obsessed with Tony Robbins. So I'm always doing that stuff. But really, I think the biggest thing is probably understanding my nervous system, understanding my brain and deciding that I'm going to take control of my brain instead of my brain having control of me. I used to be a very anxious, reactive person. And I was like this. I just don't want to be like this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so between the coaching and the trauma therapy and really starting to understand again that it couldn't have been any other way. But now I have a choice because I have knowledge and I want to figure out who my authentic self is. So it's been a lot of that continued healing through self-coaching. I have two coaches, 
I, I'm constantly, you know, reading and learning and learning more. And the, um, I've always been this fierce advocate for women, all women, certainly for physicians. Now I'm branching out into the corporate world, but to leave our advanced feminist coaching certification, like set me on fire. Like, I mean, I, um, that is like my passion now is just to be able to help women understand because when you start to tell people this, they look at you like, oh my God, thank you. Like, I'm not broken. It is yes. not me. Yeah. Yeah. And just that we, if we just can start to understand that our brains are just trying to protect us because it still thinks we live in a cave. Yeah. Really all your, all your brain cares about is that you have food feel pleasure. You don't feel pain and you're not going to die. Like literally that's it. And so we got to understand what all the motivations are. Yeah. Find what yeah. We do and right. that we deserve to be happy. And, you know, just to the way we've been socialized as women doesn't mean that that's, when we understand it, that that's how we have to live out our future. And we get to decide from an, a different place as an adult, I get to decide now who I want my authentic self to be. Yes. Yeah. And trust that like yeah. the self-trust that if I take that step towards the life I really want or the things that I really want, that you know, I'll be okay. Yeah. Cause that's the yeah. message we get is if you do that, you won't be okay. If you do it the way you want, if you don't do it the way they say it won't be okay. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think you probably remember this day. I think all of our minds were blown on this call when it came up that if a bunch of strong, empowered, independent women got together, we would take down the patriarchy and they don't want that. <laughs> that was like yes. etched in my brain. Yes. Really yeah. etched in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. And actually let's talk about that. Cause the next question on my, um, on my list here was like, what does fear? Cause you said, you know, you told your partner, Hey, I'm a fierce, I'm a fiercely independent mm -hmm. woman. And you know, there is this big fear because the narrative is just, you're not partnered because you're successful. You're not partnered because you make money. You're not partnered because you're not feminine enough. You're not, I mean, like there's just so much. It, it's like, you know, the, the message that there's something wrong with a woman who is strong, who is fierce, who is empowered, who has her own money, who is independent, who makes her own choices without waiting for validation. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that there's something wrong with that. That message is so strong and so loud, really everywhere you go. Even, even if people are not using those words, the response you get when you are that person. Yeah. And I, I even experienced it at school when I challenge in something that, you know, principal or professional says about my kids or wants to do with my kids. I'm just like, this is everywhere. <laughs> it is everywhere. But like you said, we get backlash from it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the leadership world, you know, for every one woman getting promoted into a leadership role, two are leaving mm -hmm. leadership because of all of this backlash. And you, know, you, you talk in a meeting and then a man talks over you. Well, they're socialized to believe that we don't know what we're doing and what we're saying. So they're co usually coming at it from an unconscious gender bias place. Or if you have an idea in a meeting and then the man repeats it and he gets credit for it. I mean, this is, so this is what my focus is now for coaching because the backlash is so severe that women are just saying it's enough. I, I don't need this, um, you know, and it's just not worth all the barriers that we're trying to fight. And we've certainly yeah. made a lot of strides, but there's, there's so much more, you know, to go. And, mm -hmm. um, an empowered woman is unstoppable. An mm. empowered woman who takes a long time to love yourself, as we know, to go through the process, right, of not criticizing all the time. And um, but an empowered woman, like I said, they're where we are unstoppable because we're survivors. Women are survivors, mm. right? Like, like um, it's hilarious. Tony Robbins talks about. I never knew this, but men can only process on one side of their brain and women can process across both sides. That's why like we have mom hearing and like mm -hmm. we can multitask and do like 10 things at a time. Like our brains are very different and we bring so much to like the leadership world and we save companies that are going bankrupt and we're great communicators. And we build great teams. 
But then what do we do is we sacrifice ourselves for the team. Mm. We want everyone else to be okay at our expense. And so it's the learning, like we deserve, we have a voice, a voice that matters. We need to take care of ourselves. Um, Self-care, self-love, self-compassion. Mm-hmm. These are all things that women struggle with, obviously. Um, and so it is really, you know, deciding I just, I'm worth this. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to go for this. Yeah. And, you know, you, you know, you talk about the backlash in leadership and in the corporate world and, you know, that's polite society compared to the backlash in the dating world. <laughs> oh my Lord. Okay. Let's talk dating. Okay. I got ghosted a couple of times. Okay. I, can I tell you a story you will not believe? Yes. Yes. Okay. I will not name the organization, but I paid a significant amount of money to this organization and on my first and only date, um, was like a matchmaker, correct. Okay. And, um, the, <laughs> the, of course the man did not look like his picture. He probably, you know, had, maybe was from 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, he walked in and we were talking he's like, um, can you get up and go to the restroom so I can see the goods? <gasps> and I was like, I thought, okay, this is really happening. I hadn't dated in two years. And I was like, so he's joking. And then we were talking and I was like, what do I do? Like, I was like, so I should get up and leave. And then he goes, you know, so, um, you know, I know no sex on the first date, but what about the second date? And I was like, I got to go. And I literally walked out the door and I was like, I can't believe this just happened. So I called the, the, the dating company and this was like several thousands of dollars. And yeah, I was matchmaking like, services are usually 10, yeah. 15, 20,000. Like, I think there's a miscommunication about what I'm looking for. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm so sorry. We'll set you up with this other guy. And then I, I was like, you know what? I got the profile. I was like, I think I joined. Mm-hmm. And they wouldn't give me my money back. But I was like, this was unbelievable. But that was yeah. only the beginning of some of the dating stories. Oh and this whole goodness. online dating thing was so new to me. Um, Cause when I got married back in 1991, it was like, you go on one date, you're in love. You spend the rest of your life together. Right? And then, I, know, I thought that too. When I first yeah, got, when right? I first went online, but this was like, Oh my God, all the swiping. It was like a full-time job. I'm like, I don't have time. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, probably the six or seven dates, uh, I was like, this is a trip. I will say though, that I did have three dates in 24 hours one time because I'm busy. I had to get them all arranged, but I was like, I'm done now. I was like, yeah, yeah. I have, I have one client. Uh, she actually celebrated her uh, one year anniversary <laughs> in February, and she was like a machine. She was like, I'm. She, you know, one of people who's just very structured. She's like, okay, divorce is over. Did my therapy. Therapist gave me the go ahead to start dating. Hired my dating coach. <laughs> like I love it. And she like she was so structured. She stacked up her dates. Like she was like, okay, I work nine to five. She would stack eight dates on the weekend. <laughs> four on Saturday, oh, like two and a half hours apart. Four on Sunday, and she just went through. Oh, right. Good yeah. Man. Yeah, because and I think you know. In some ways, a lot of that is, um, I, and I like her story and the stories of those who have met people because I always make sure that the person that I'm working with really wants a partner. Like you have, like don't because if you're wishy washy and you're not sure you want to be partnered, it almost makes you susceptible to like all the nonsense out there because you're in that wishy washy state, and so you're not like cutting people off very early like you did. Like oh, this happened. Okay. We're not having a second date. Um, And the core premise of that process is we only date the good guys. So I teach my clients to recognize who the good guys are, which is what matchmaking service is supposed to help you, help you do. Oh my. Like only good guys. This is how to tell who the good guys are. This is how to tell, you know, so that you're not going on any bad dates. The the one thing I, you know, I try to teach, we don't want any bad dates. He might not be the one but you will not have a bad date. That's awesome. Yeah. And then you can have, because if you're having good dates, then it's, it's not, it doesn't feel so bad. Right. Because most of the stories you hear from people now are awful and that they don't want to you know, do this anymore. And yeah. they'd rather be alone rather than have to deal with this mess of dating and weeding through, you know, these yeah. people. And, 
Yeah, um, because when things so. are said to you, demeaning things, it's almost like, you know, you're putting yourself in a place where demeaning things are being said to you. Like, it's almost like you're signing up to be demeaned or yes. to be harassed or groped or all those things. Like, why, why would we sign up for that? <laughs> I know. And, and I think, you know, it's interesting because, um, again, I'll mention Tony Robbins, but he asks people oftentimes in a live audience, who here, how many women have worried about their safety in the last, and every woman raises their hand. Yeah. And then if he asks the same of men, zero. And, yeah. they, and he's like, women are prey. Yeah. Our, our natural enemy is men. Yes, so 100%. we have to be so careful about our safety and how much we let people know about us. And mm-hmm. it seems like it's a very, you know, you know better than me, but such a different world about people's integrity when you mm-hmm. meet them and what the stories they're telling you and why they're wanting to be with you. And yeah, but you know what's even harder? Like there is the the fact that women are natural prey for men, and you know. But we're also socialized to not offend men. Yes. And so yes. there's this book that I listened to. Uh, it's called The Gift of Fear. Every woman should read it. It's by, I believe it's Gavin Becker. He's an FBI agent. So he's okay. uh, was, and his whole training was to recognize when a person is dangerous. Oh. <laughs> and so he taught those principles in that book. I mean, I had my daughter and my son <laughs> listen yeah. to the audio book when they were teenagers. And one of the things that he talks about, he says, so women are naturally and appropriately concerned when they're in the presence of a man or when they are you know, in a dark, dark alley or whatever. However, you're also groomed to not offend that person. So, you know, maybe you're in a, in an office building and it's late and you're leaving and, you know, the elevator door is open. And this is one of his examples. I think he, he did this on a talk and there's only, there's one man in the elevator. So naturally, as a woman, you would hesitate to go in. You're like, well, I don't want to be alone at 7 p.m. when everyone's gone home with a man in an elevator. But the woman was also thinking, I don't want to offend him by implying that he's a dangerous person. Wow. And he says most women will override their natural instinct to be cautious in order to please the man and will go in the elevator. That's terrifying and so true. Now that you say that, I'm like, yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. And this is where I think the empowerment and breaking that internal bias that, you know, we try to do is so helpful, right? And and that's the principle that I bring to my coaching where I'm like, no, absolutely not. Like, no, at no time is your, your value and your safety and your comfort ever less important than how the other person feels because I'm working with women who will be like, well, I don't want to break up with him because I don't want him to feel bad. I don't want him to be disappointed. Or they, they're like, I'm not sure he's the one for me, but I'm going to break up with him now instead of finding out and then having to break up after the fourth date. I'm like, yeah, but you should be taking care of you. If you need more time to decide. Yes. And he gets mad on the fourth date. That's he gets to handle his feelings, but We've been socialized to be so responsible for men's feelings, to care for their feelings, even men we don't know, even random strangers on a dating app. It's really, you know, our our brain and and, and how we've been socialized, it's just it's so powerful. It's that yeah. running dialogue that we just don't even realize is always, always the background. Yeah. Yeah. So when you like when you're thinking about things like what are some thoughts that like you? you know, for women who hesitate to truly step into being, because this is, this is, this is the whole thing. Women hesitate, my clients, the women listen to this podcast, we all hesitate to step into that uh, stereotype of fierce, which I love that you have just embraced it. You are just like, I'm a strong, fierce, independent woman yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you prove that doing that is actually a good thing. Because in a sense, you have it all. You have the career and you have the partner because you did that and you insisted on waiting for a man who wanted that, who was okay with that, who supported that. So the journey from, okay, I'm afraid to be called intimidating by this guy on the app. I'm afraid of being called, because I had that said to me too. I've had that, you know, because then I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll tell you this part of my story was I 
I, I went on an early date, probably maybe the second or third date I went on when I was dating. And this person kissed me oh. after the date. And I was not expecting it. And I it was not welcome. I did not want to be kissed out of I'm, I'm That like, was not I was, welcome. I love it. Was just, it was just not a thing that like, I'm like, I don't know, you know, like that's very intimate thing. It was not something I wanted to do with people that I didn't know. So I, um, you know, I was taken aback and I was like, okay, so I put in measures in place going forward. I was like, okay, so once the date was scheduled the day before the date, or if I, was, I would text and say, hey, looking forward to seeing you. Um, I would prefer, you know, not to be kissed or whatever. I'm happy to, sh- you know, shake your hand or give you a hug, but, you know, and I would just say, hey, I prefer, and some men would get angry at that jeez mm, like they were upset that I said please don't kiss me after the date like I just want to yeah. talk and get to know you and it was just it was just usually just a one line and I didn't like it wasn't scoldy um and so I I recognize that when you do step into that it's not a like we, we do the rah-rah be empowered thing but there is a real response when as we move through the world with it um, what are the thoughts that you know women need? What are the I don't know, attitudes? What do we need to embrace in order to fully be able to be that fierce, independent woman? If that's who we are, I think there's a, several things, and the first one is to really um, understand. And I, have, I hate to say from like the coaching standpoint, but really understanding your brain and how it's working, and that mm. there are these thoughts that are constantly going around. If you if 50,000 thoughts a day are telling us that we're not good enough, we're not attractive enough, we're not this, we're not that, we criticize everything we do, that's going to show up in the results that we get in our life. So really, mm-hmm. you know, having someone help you understand that and then really deciding again, who you want to be, realizing that you're going to, people are going to be offended by you. Mm-hmm. And guess what? You can't make a person think, feel, or act a certain way towards you, nor can they Mm -hmm. do that for you. So for instance, if you're in a leadership role, if you're doing your leadership role like right, you know, effectively, guess what? Everybody isn't gonna like you. Mm -hmm. They'll respect you. Everybody isn't gonna like you though. And as women, we that really bothers us because again, it goes back to the cave mandates, right? If you weren't liked, you got kicked out of the cave. But, and we're people pleasers and, the, and we don't have to be people, pleasers, right? We have to please ourselves. And as long as we're showing up after we figure out sort of how we're showing up, how we're responding, reacting and things like this, and we get a hold of that, that if, that if, if we're happy with the way we're showing up, that if people don't like you or mm-hmm. in whatever circumstance, that that's not your business. It's just that you yeah. have to be happy with the way you're showing up. Yeah. And of course, self-awareness is a huge piece. Mm-hmm. And um, I have all of my clients take a few tests. One is from positive intelligence and one is the Enneagram looking at your personality type because you basically, your whole personality type and traits were set in place by the time you were seven years old based on what mm-hmm. happened to you again as a child. And so like, for me, taking these tests was enlightening because I realized that I'm a control freak and a stickler and a perfectionist for a reason. It was because of all the trauma that I encountered in my childhood. I had to control and try to rationalize my life because my nervous system was trying to keep me safe. Mm -hmm. And so, but that is of course, you know, only gotten more amplified as I went into adulthood and certainly being a physician. But for me, like, I have personality traits that I'm great at leading teams and getting things done. But then if I don't think people are doing them the way that I think it should be done, I can squash teams because I mm-hmm. just like move out of the way. I'll do it myself. <laughs> but, it, but are, again, these are all self-awareness pieces that actually help you take the lid off of the box yes. and be like, okay, now I understand I, why I am this way. And you know what? I, I want to change this or I want to work on this. And it's, it's yeah. actually so much power. So you actually start to understand how you're showing up in situations. And mm-hmm. again, when you start to understand how your brain is working, like we learn through life coaching, you can actually start to plan your results intentionally. You know, it's a process, mm-hmm. right? It's not 100%. tomorrow everything will be amazing. But when you start doing it and you see the power of it and that you can actually get control back in your life mm-hmm. that and other people don't have control of you, that's when you become unstoppable. Yes. Yes. So good. Yeah. And um, there's the piece you talked about, like it's not all rainbows and daisies in that 
coaching process to go from being that people pleaser to fully stepping into being empowered. And one of the things that is challenging along the way is learning to tolerate the discomfort yes. of the fact that other people are going to respond the way they're going to respond. Um, but if you can see that intentional result that you want, because I mean, literally, I, I never stop sending the text saying, hey, please don't, um, I prefer no physical contact on the first date. Because I knew that like, it didn't matter what the backlash was. I really just didn't want that. I, I preferred the discomfort of knowing that some men would not be pleased to the yeah. discomfort of being pissed over and over when I didn't want it. It was kind of like, this is the intentional result that I want. <laughs> And so yeah. I'm going to tolerate this discomfort of yeah. disapproval in order to have that. And I think that shows up in all of these areas that you're talking about. Yeah. And definitely, and I think it's so much fear that women have for so many reasons. And so much, you know, so much of it really is safety reasons. But mm -hmm. if you look at what fear stands for, it's false evidence appearing real. Mm -hmm. So it's so much of the stories that we create around not having a partner, not being married, you know, and just fear of being alone and fear of what my family's going to say, and what my friends mm -hmm. are going to say, and my work colleagues are going to say. And just starting to realize again, nobody could make us think, feel, or act anyway. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. this they're in between the fear of what's everyone gonna say um, if I don't have a partner? What's everyone gonna say when I decide to go for a partner, but then I'm this strong, professional, successful, wealthy woman, yeah. and now I'm getting it from this end that. I can't have a partner because I'm quote unquote intimidated. It's, it's we create. And so society has created all these catch 22s. Yeah, it really has. It's really up to the individual woman to say, all right, what do I really want? Who do I really want to be? And then growing to the point where you're willing to tolerate the gap between who you are and who others want you to be. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This has been so, so good. All right. So most of the women listening to this um, are in midlife. They are dating after divorce or they are newly divorced and like starting to learn, and get ready to date. What advice do you have from them just from your own experience um, to just say, you know, to help them along that journey? One of the biggest pieces I would say is that you have to give yourself time to heal from other things and um, trust yourself make decisions that when you know something isn't right, red mm -hmm. flags, all the things that you will act on them. And that um, you are an amazing individual who's ready enough. You're not broken. And just realizing that, think about all the times that we've gotten in a relationship and we're like, oh, I'm going to be happy now. And then you get that relationship and you're like, I'm not so happy. Is that really deciding what you want? Like I made a list, actually, one of my friends, she was so funny. She's like, we're making your list of deal breakers and flexible. Right. And I looked at that list um, probably a year into my current relationship. And I was like, oh my God, I stuck to my list and I had totally forgotten about it. But I really sat down because at first I was like, oh, I don't know. I can't make a list. And then I just started writing things, you know, mm. things that were absolute. There was no way um, mm. because especially from previous relationships, things that caused issues like that. I knew there was no way that it was going to work. Mm -hmm. So I think not selling ourselves short and and not letting the socialization pieces hold us back, like that we have to be with a partner um, and that they you know that. In, it's a man that they know better and, you know, they make better decisions and always, I mean, mm -hmm. certainly relationships are compromises, but there are always boundaries that cannot be crossed. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Oh, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. This has been such a delightful conversation. Um, let's talk about like who you work with, what your coaching programs look like, what you have going right now so that anyone who wants to connect with you can participate. Thank you. Um, so I, I do life coaching um, and my trauma coaching. So I have a lot of one-on-one -on -one clients and that includes leadership as well. I'm getting ready to launch actually my 10-week um, leadership coaching cohort. And it's every week is a different topic. And I'm just so excited about all the topics. 
Um, so we're actually doing a webinar tonight about that. So I'm very excited. And I really, um, my mission again is to have men and women understand how they're socialized, what holds women back in leadership. But um, I I'm also, I work with mostly women physicians. Some are not women physicians, they're just, they're women professionals that I'm branching into the corporate world as well. Because, you know, physicians, we, we struggle with certain issues, but the issues that women face in medicine versus the corporate world are so similar. Mm. I mean, there's some things that are particular to each one, but the issues are, are the same. Women who are burning themselves out, feeling like they have to answer emails 24 seven, they never get a break, they come home, they have superwoman syndrome where they're trying to be, look perfect, act perfect, be the perfect wife, perfect mom, perfect, perfect person in their profession. And then at the end of the day, they're like, I'm miserable, <laughs> you know, and I, how did I get here? And so I really just wanna, you know, help women, all women figure this out. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, because while men are socialized to be like, yeah, I'm okay. I did it right. <laughs> Women are socialized to be like, oh, didn't do it right. Never done it right. Haven't ever done it right. And just be on that treadmill. Oh, yeah. And just not trusting ourselves, I think, in, in so many different ways. And so mm -hmm. um, I'm excited. My I had just rebranded. So my website is stephaniebryerly.com. And um, just excited about the future and new clients and my group coaching. And I'm, I'm like, you know, um, the more women I can help at one time, it's just, you know, it's my passion. So I'm so excited about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing listeners. We're going to have all of Stephanie's links in the show notes, including the leadership uh, workshop that you're doing tonight. Yes. It's going to be in there. Yeah. Yes. And, and then your article and website. Thank you so much. And one of the things I'm really excited about is I'm in, the last week of my coaching cohort, we're going to be talking about how do you balance your masculine and feminine energy so that you mm. can still bring the feminine parts of you that you want to bring. Because so many women yeah. feel like they have to act like men at work. And right. Yeah. So, so good. So it's good. Get, getting back the passion and the sexy part. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. All right, listeners, thank you so much for your time and attention today. We appreciate you uh, just spending this 40, 45 minutes with us. Stephanie, thanks for sharing your story. We appreciate it. Um, for everyone, we will see you next time. Thank you. It was wonderful.